All right, Coach, this is uh, show number one. Uh -huh. uh, a season, you know, we could do 17 or 18 weeks, or it could be longer. That's the plan, the as long as we can go. Okay. Uh, how does a kid who was in Germany, Panama, Washington, D.C., end up playing in the National Football League and then becoming a head coach? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's been a journey, it really has. Um, you know, and, and lifelong had a lot to do with growing up in a military family. You know, my, my father being stationed all over the world, all over the United States, uh, really helped to, to round us, you know, me and my three brothers. And I think just the love of sports is what gave me the opportunity, what created my opportunity to, to play collegiately, then play in the NFL. And then my love of the game of football gave me the opportunity to become a coach. And, and I guess, as they say, the rest is history. Uh, what age were you here in D.C. and where did you live? Oh, wow. We lived actually in, in Maryland. Okay. Um, my dad was stationed at Fort Meade. And uh, that's where I first played my first football. I was in the second grade playing Pee Wee football. <laughs> were you big then too? Oh yeah, I was. <laughs> I was. I was uh, on the offensive line, defensive line, right off the bat. All right. So here's the question. You know, everybody knows your career with the Bears, '85 Super Bowl team. I was doing some research. I saw the Super Bowl shuffle, and I did not see Ron Rivera. What is? I mean, I would think you had some rhythm. What, I don't understand. Actually, I don't have any rhythm. <laughs> my wife will tell you that for sure. Okay. Um, but the truth is. There's a group of us that didn't show up. What happened was they filmed that the day after we got beat on Monday Night Football. Okay. And what happened was we, we flew in and landed in Chicago around 5.30 in the morning. Because remember, back then, Monday Night Football started at 9 o'clock. Yes. Didn't get over till around 1 o'clock. By the time you get showered up, get to the airport, it's already 3 o'clock, and it's about a three-and-a-half-hour flight to Chicago. Mm -hmm. So we landed sometime 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. And they said, hey, we're going to do this charity thing, blah, blah, blah. And a bunch of guys showed up, and a bunch of us went home and went to sleep. If you look at that, too, and look at it carefully, oh yeah, um, Mike Singletary, Walter Payton, William Perry, Jim McMahon were all blue screened in. Right. They weren't there either. It was a good, was a good job yeah. by them to blue screen them in. Um, but you're playing for a guy named Mike Ditka. Yes. What was that like? <laughs> That was tough, um, you know, because it was back in the days when, when you still had two a days full padded. Yeah. Um, you, didn't, you didn't have any limits on the number of guys that could come to training camp, and you didn't have any time limits either. So you literally, at six o'clock in the morning, the horn would go off throughout the dorm, get everybody up. You would go to breakfast and be out on the practice field at 8:30, and we would practice all morning, have a lunch break, go into meetings, and practice all late afternoon into into about 5:30. Had dinner and then you had meetings till 11, till till about 10:30 and then you had bed check at 11. Right. So, it was it was tough. Um, I learned a lot from coach. I learned a lot from playing for Buddy Ryan. Buddy Ryan, yeah. Um, I had a tremendous amount of teachers in terms of my positional coaches as my career went on. And and probably one of my favorites was Dave McGinnis, who coached me at linebacker when I played for the Bears. So my name is Chick. Your your nickname these days is Riverboat Ron. Yeah. But I hear that Buddy Ryan had a nickname for you. Yes, Buddy called me Chico because I look like Freddie Prince. <laughs> <coughs> Buddy's favorite, fa Buddy's favorite TV show was Chico and the Man. Okay, Jack Albertson, Freddie yeah. Prince, right? So what happened was, my rookie year, Buddy made me stand back there with him behind the defense as we watched practice, and I would sit there and watch practice with him, mm -hmm. and he would talk to me about football, okay. about why, hey, why do you think we're doing this? Hey, we're doing this because we want to stop that, and he was grooming me to a degree. Because I was Mike's backup, I backed up Singletary at the middle linebacking position um, for most of the Super Bowl year. Right. Um, and so what happened was that's how I kind of learned and developed uh, um, my 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 philosophies on, on football. So you wanted to be a coach after those kind of, or did you? <clears throat> I thought about it, and okay. something I always thought about. And then really what happened was when I first got out of football, I did some radio and TV. I worked for Sports Channel Chicago and, and WGN. So you came to the dark side for yes, a little bit. Yes, I did. Uh, I learned a lot. But I also learned that I missed the game way too much, and I wanted to get back into it. And, and, and my wife, Stephanie, is really the one who pushed me to get back into football. Because she wanted you out of the house. Probably. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you go to Carolina, and then you come here. Look, I'm a guy, this year has been an unbelievable year. I've had cancer, I've had COVID, and then I've got this brand new job. You got diagnosed your first year here, and then decided to coach while getting treatment. Did you learn anything about yourself? <laughs> Um, I, I, I learned that I, I follow directions. I do what I'm told. Um, I try to do what the doctors told me to do. I try to make sure I, I did all those things. And one of the things that I misunderstood was that I was supposed to work, okay. that, that, that I, I had to work, that I should not get into the hospital if 
and 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 I like I said, I just misunderstood the way it was phrased to me, mm -hmm. and so that's why I pushed myself without realizing. Uh, and I think I found that um, you know, I, if I push myself, I, I I I have pretty good limits. Sure. And what did you hear from your players as they watched you go through this while coaching them? I think one of the most uh, amazing things is, was was their support. It really was, and. You know, and it also came at a time when, when Alex Smith was here and he was making his comeback, which I thought was one of the really tr uh, tremendous comebacks, and, and it was something that was really cool. And so they got a couple of examples of guys that really just pushed themselves through to, 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 to get through things, and, and I think that really helped our guys, and I think it helped us win that division that year. You got new ownership here, a brand new vibe. With new ownership, though, comes, I don't know if it's job insecurity, but do you even think about that at all as far as what the future holds for Ron Rivera? No, no, I don't. Um, because really, it, it goes back to that you take it one at a time. Um, and I can only control what I can control, and that's what I'm doing. So I'm doing the best I can. Um, I like the things that we're doing. I like where we are as a football team. I like where we are as an organization. I, I appreciate who Mr. Harris is and his, and his partners. Um, if there's been one thing that's really clear cut, more so than anything else, it's just their desire to make this a first-class organization, their desire to win. And I think that's important, and it's been very crystal clear and, and very transparent. So I just appreciate that, and we'll see how it goes. We're going to have 18 to 23 weeks together. I'm going to ask you this one time, one time only. The prior ownership, you came into this with one thought, and then as you're going through it, Coach, there was chaos around this organization. Did that affect your job at all? Was it difficult? to keep that out of the building, even though it was in the building? Well, it was hard because, you know, and I, I said this about the meeting, I said, you know, you guys bring it to us. And, and, and so what I've tried to make sure I focus on and try to get the players to focus on is let's focus on what's important, not what's interesting. Mm -hmm. And to me, what was important was what we did on the football field. I got, you know, I understand how serious all the other things were, and I get that part of it. And, and, and again, I don't want to make light of it. But my focus as the football coach was to represent the organization as best as I, ca I could and at the same time get everything we could straight on the football field. Right. You brought in Eric Bieniemy, uh, whose reputation is well known as a guy who that offense is ridiculous. Talking to the players and when they see that playbook the first time, they're stunned at what can be. Um, did anything surprise you? You've had you know, a couple months with him now. Anything surprise you about him? Not really. I mean. Um, I got a pretty good insight into who he was. Um, I actually was on the coaching staff when we had him in Philadelphia okay. when I was coaching for Andy Reid back in the day. So Andy was one of the people I talked to about, uh, I called to talk about Eric, and Andy was tremendous about him. And then I, I called a couple other guys that, was on that were on that coaching staff that was with Eric the last five years. And, you know, Dave Tobe, who he and I were roommates at one time when we, when we worked for the Bears, and Steve Spagnola, who was on the on the original Andy Reid staff and asked him about Eric and they told me you're going to get this kind of guy he's phenomenal you know just so everything that they told me he's been and then some and 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 I'll say you know it it, it, it it's to me it, it, I do wonder why how come he hadn't gotten his chance yet because I, I do think he deserves that opportunity based on what I've watched. You're surprised by the backlash you got when you talked yeah, about him? I was because Again, I, I didn't get it because, you know, I, I really believe I'm one of Eric's biggest advocates. I believe in the things that he does. Um, he and I talk about them, you know, and, and sometimes I, you know, I do have questions, but his answers make sense. The thing that really caught my attention with him more so than anything else was how he, how he paid attention to details. He reminded me so much of Coach Reed. Um, and then the other thing I really appreciated was what he said on his first press conference. That was, we need to learn to be comfortable when we're uncomfortable. And when he said that, that really got me thinking about a lot of things. And one of the things is that maybe I had gotten comfortable as a head coach. Because for 12 years, I had the same type of system. I had the same type of, of scheduling. And in talking to Eric and listening to him talk about scheduling and stuff, I thought, you know what? Eric, one of the things I want you to do is I want you to handle the scheduling. I want you to look at what you've done in the past, and let's put it together. So I gave him the parameters. He came to me with all of his scheduling, mapped it out. We went through a bunch of things. And I said, hey, how about if we did this? And how about if we did that? And what about this piece? And that's been it. And he's done a great job as it. So 
I can tell you right now that as a head coach, I can see exactly where he's going to go as a head coach um, because it's, it's, it is really about learning to be comfortable when you're uncomfortable. Um, some of the things that we've done, we've done in practice, uh, I did when I was with Andy Reid, right. but I kind of morphed a little bit. We changed them, and now going back to it, I see the other side again. So it's, it's, been, it's been good for me. It's been good for our football team. Um, I love the way our players approach the games. I know they're preseason games, and I get that. And they, they really don't mean much except for the growth and development of our football team, which has been really good. Um, learning how to finish, learning how to win games. And that is one of the things that we talked about is winning begets winning. Before we get to who will not be on this squad, you have that awful decision to make going from 90 to 53. You're cutting a lot of guys. What is that process like? Is there screaming and yelling from the position coaches? Yeah, there is. And I wouldn't say screaming and yelling as much as it, it's a good conversation. Okay. Um, what we did in our process was um, was yesterday I met with the entire coaching staff and we talked about every player at every position. Okay. Um, and then myself and the coordinators, we went in with Marty and Martin and their staff on the personnel side and we went over every position and every player right. and we talked about where these guys could fit and there were some <laughs> constant, you know, well, moving this and moving that back and then putting him back up there. <laughs> And it went on for a while, okay. just trying to get to the right spot. Um, and again, we wanted to make sure everybody was heard and that when we made the final decision, we all felt good about it um, going out of that room. Now, you know, things are going to change between now and tomorrow when we make the last set of cuts. Sure. Um, because, you know, we'll have to talk about it. There's some guys already out on the waiver wires, and we talked about a couple of the positions that right. if there's somebody available, we have to seriously consider that if that person would fit us, whether it be offense, defense, or special sure. teams. One of those guys, uh, which it's out now, is uh, Jared Patterson, local kid, Pilate High School, been on the practice squad the last couple of years. That's a tough one yes, it to, was. to make. What do you say? Uh, I, I'd just say it was a tremendously tough one. It really was. It, it was first of all, it's a very good room. You know, We assembled a good running back room. Uh, we liked the guys. We liked Jared. Um, part of the reason I did it, and I told Jared, was to get him out there now so people know he's out there give him that opportunity, that chance to get out on the uh, on somebody else's roster. And you never know. I mean, if he doesn't and he's still out there and, and our situation changes and we need a guy, I, I, I don't think we'd hesitate to bring him back. Sure. He did a great job here. He's a young man that proved that he belongs in the NFL, and I hope he gets another shot. And if that shot is somewhere else, then I'll be very happy. I really will yeah. be very happy for him because he's the right kind of young man and he deserves the opportunity. All right, each week, I'm going to invite a fan to ask a question. Okay, okay. Well, you're okay with that? Okay, and I'm going to, I'll be the one to decipher because there's some nutballs out there. You know who we are. Um, so here's the first question. It's from a Sean M. I just want you to take a look and listen. What's up, Coach? Uh, I had one question for you, and I think I know the answer to this. You've been coaching for a long time, man. You've been around a lot of players. What's the funniest and craziest bunch of linebackers you've ever coached? I think I know the answer to that one. All right, Coach. Good luck this year. Kick some butt. Uh, he does know the answer. Sean Merriman was one of my favorites, um, guys that I coached. And we have a guy right now that reminds me so much. Of Who's him. that? Chase. Okay. He and Chase Young could, 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 be, could be brothers. Wow. Um, High praise. Because of the type of young men they are. They love people. They love football. They're really all about it. Um, but that group of linebackers I had in San Diego was pretty special. He was, he was one of the kingpins of it. Um, man, uh, you know, just... Gosh, dog, I, I can see them all right now. And it was a heck of a group. And, you know, one time that group of guys, we were the number one defense in the NFL. By the way, can you hear the police coming for me? I think I just heard that. Coach, thank you very much. All we'll right. see you next week before the first game. Um, Sean Merriman, of course, a Maryland Terrapin and one of your guys. He wishes you good luck, and so do we. I appreciate it, Chick.